since 9-11, Pakistan has been very much on our minds. Um, you turn on the TV, you open the newspaper, and Pakistan tends to be on the front page or the, or, or the next. And more often than not, Pakistan's seen as a threat. And I'm going to give you the punchline right now, which is that actually, I think we need to see Pakistan not just as a threat, but also as an opportunity. And that I'm actually um, cautiously optimistic, which is a very um, diplomatese phrase, State Department phrase, but I'm cautiously optimistic about Pakistan. And I'll maybe explain to you why, why I feel that way. Why is Pakistan important? For five principal reasons. The first, clearly, and this is the one we hear most about, is that Pakistan is, is the epicenter of terrorism today. The second that we also hear quite a lot about is Pakistan's role in Afghanistan. Um, Pakistan, President Musharraf, um, thank you, President Musharraf and uh, Pac uh, Afghan President Karzai um, have, shall we say, a less than ideal relationship. They don't like one another at all, but the two countries have actually worked quite hard over the last few years to build a relationship, to work together, um, and, and that does appear to be improving with some dips, but certainly there is no question that, in, that if we are going to uh, improve the situation in Afghanistan, we are going to have to do it alongside of Pakistan. So that's, that's reason number two. Reason number three is since 1998, uh, when Pakistan tested a nuclear weapon, Pakistan is now a nuclear weapon state. While we don't call it that formally, and we can't because of the rules and the regulations that the Non-Proliferation Treaty mandates, Pakistan nevertheless has nuclear weapons. It is a nuclear weapon state. And the other part of that is that the primary um, instigator, if you will, of uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons comes from Pakistan. A.Q. Khan, the father of Pakistan's nuclear bomb, um, is also the head, was also the head of the largest black market of nuclear weapons, nuclear technology that we've seen thus far. So that is the third reason why we care. The fourth reason, and this is a slightly more optimistic one, that at times, not often enough, but at times, Pakistan is a Muslim-majority democracy. It is today a Muslim-majority democracy. And we care very deeply about that and about Pakistan, like Turkey, as a demonstration effect, perhaps. And then the fifth reason is the Silk Road, is its strategic location, that Pakistan lies between Central Asia and Southeast Asia, between the Middle East and Southeast Asia, and therefore has a very important role in the economic flows from the one region, region to the other. So how did we get here? How did we get to where we are today? If I'd stood in front of you 15 months ago, I would have said, okay, uh, President Musharraf, not perhaps terribly dem democratically elected, although he did go through an election in 2002. But Pakistan's a stable, relatively stable country. They're working with us on, on the war on terror. They're working with us in Afghanistan. They're working with us on non-proliferation. Things are looking pretty good. Things started to go downhill in March of last year, and go downhill particularly for President Musharraf. In March of last year, March of 2007, President Musharraf dismissed the Supreme Court Justice Chowdhury. And what that resulted in, much to the surprise of President Musharraf, and I, <coughs> frankly to the United States and many others as well, is demonstrations on the streets. And while we've seen demonstrations in Pakistan before, the demonstrations on the streets were led by the lawyers. So if you will, I don't know whether you remember the photos, but somewhat unusual, you've got lots of men in black suits, white shirts, black ties, demonstrating on Pakistan streets. And they're not demonstrating for political parties. They're demonstrating for an independent judiciary. And that's worth remembering. Think how powerful that is. You've got people demonstrating because they want to maintain an independent judiciary. That was in March. In July of 2007, July of last year, uh, the Red Mosque, which was the central, uh, largest mosque in Islamabad, um, the two leaders, the two brothers who led at the Red Mosque, um, essentially declared war on the Pakistani government and said, we insist that we are going to fight unless you declare Sharia law across the country, unless you implement a certain, other, certain other changes within the governing system. And the, the people from the mosque were going out, they were capturing uh, visitors, they were, ca they were killing and they were capturing um, 
policemen, they were setting fire to, um, to, to video stores, and Mushraf said, that's enough, and sent in his military. We don't know how many were killed. We think it's in the ballpark of about 100. Um, but in July, in sending in the military into the mosque and in taking over the mosque for a period, what Mushraf did was antagonize um, that sector of Pakistani society that are more religious. They weren't necessarily extreme, had held extreme views then, but following the siege, many of them did. That was in July. That led to the failure of the, the peace deals that had taken place in the northwest frontier province in the federally administered tribal areas on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, the peace deals but, that we heard so much about between the Pakistani government and the locals, the local tribes. On October 6th, there was a presidential election. Well, Mushraf won the presidential election. He won it with something like 90 plus percent of the votes. He won it with 90 plus percent of the votes because pretty much every other leader pulled out of the elections. They all boycotted. In November, uh, President, excuse me, and this was October, October 6th. November 3rd, President Mushraf called a state of emergency. And he called a state of emergency because the judiciary was about to dismiss the election results and was about to depose him. And so the only way he could retain power was to call a state of emergency, which he did. And about three weeks later, he took off his uniform. He stepped down from being the chief of army staff, something he had promised to do for, since 2004. And the following day, he started his new administration as the new president, the new five-year five termed president. He finally, in mid-December, recalled the state of emergency, released the state of emergency. By this time, Benazir Bhutto, the leader of the PPP, and Nawaz Sharif, the leader of the other opposition party, the PMLN, had both returned to Pakistan to run for the elections that were due in January. And later that month, on, on December 27th, Benazir Bhutto was assassinated. The elections were delayed. Um, they were then held on February 18th, and a new government was formed in March. And last week, the new government, the new coalition government, collapsed. And that's where we are today. Let me take you back to the elections. What was so important about these elections on February 18th? Well, there were a couple of things. The first message, it was a clear message against President Mushroff. Despite his managing of the elections, despite the fact that these elections were clearly not free and they were clearly not fair, the election commission was not unbiased, the interim government was not unbiased, the election rolls were not legitimate election rolls, there were a lot of people who, were died, who had died, there were a lot of double names on the election rolls. So these were clearly not free and fair elections. Despite this, there was a clear vote against Mushroff. 33% of the people who voted, voted for Benazir Bhutto's party, the Bhutto party, the PPP. Another 26% voted for Nawaz Sharif's party, the PMLN. Only 15% voted for what they call the King's party, Mushraf's party, the PMLQ. And just as a little note here, the MMA, the religious coalition, which had held uh, in the previous elections in 2002, 11% of the vote, went down to 2%. What were the surprises for the elections? Well, the first surprise was actually how well Nawaz Sharif did, how well the PML ended. Uh, it came in with a quarter of the, of, of the votes. The second real surprise was the lack of attacks on the day. In the run-up to the elections, um, the militants had clearly targeted the political process, were trying to prevent a fair political process take place on election day. So there had been um, political leaders who had been killed, there had been bombs going off, in voting areas, in schools. There was very little of that on the day. The third major surprise was actually how fair the day turned out. Nobody thought it would do. Clearly, as I mentioned, the run-up to the election was not fair. The day was. What wasn't a surprise was the MMA only getting 2%. And I just say this because what you're hearing, from, what you've heard from a lot of people is, well, the fact that the MMA, the religious coalition, only got 2%, that's a statement that Pakistanis are moving away from religiosity. They're becoming less Islamic, less, uh, less extreme. That's actually sadly, or not sadly, but that's certainly not the case. 
The reason the MMA only got 2%, there are really two principal reasons. One, the MMA, which is this religious coalition, a number of the major parties in this religious coalition boycotted the election. That's reason number one. Reason number two is the MMA traditionally only gets 5 to 6% of the popular vote. And this should tell you, and again, I'm just this is a little note, uh, an aside from this story, which is the thought that Pakistan is absolutely jam-packed with extremists is not true. The religious coalition typically gets 5% of the popular vote. It's worth remembering that. Um, this time they got two. So where does that, that put us today? There are four main players in Pakistan today, um, and there have been uh, the mullahs, clearly, the military, and that's comprised of the army, but also the uh, intelligence services, the ISI. The politicians is the third major base of power, and the people. The people is a recent base of power. The people have not come out as they have done in the last year since the 70s. And that's a very important thing to remember, and I'll come back to that later on. What's going to happen? Well, if we look at a snapshot of Pakistan today, first of all, very unstable politics. Uh, this is not going to change anytime soon, I'm afraid. Um, within the political system, four centers of power. There's the PPP, there's Azaf, Asaf Zardari, who is Benazir Bhutto's husband, who now leads the PPP. What you will read in the papers is that the new prime minister, who is a member of the PPP, a gentleman by the name of Gilani. And it's clearly, one would think, that Gilani holds the power of the PPP. Not the case. Um, Gilani is a puppet. Zardari is the man who holds the power. So... One of the centers of political power is Zardari. The second one is Nawaz Sharif, who's currently in opposition. He leads the PMLN. The third is Musharraf, and I would just note for a second, Musharraf is still the president. He still holds a lot of power in Pakistan, despite the elections. And the fourth is General Kiani. This is the gentleman who now runs the military in Pakistan, who took over from President Musharraf. The coalition that came together in March after the election, the coalition that brought together the PPP and the PMLN, the two leading parties, collapsed the last week. And one of the interesting things to watch today is what new coalition will be formed. Because the PPP can't rule alone. They don't have the votes. They don't have the authority to rule alone. So the question is, the PPP will definitely be in power. Gilani will be in power. Zadari will pull the strings. But who will they govern with? <coughs> Clearly, what they would like to do is to, to bring <coughs> Nawaz Sharif back into the government. Um, but Nawaz Sharif, at the moment, the PMLN, is saying, we're not going to be part of the coalition. We're going to sit outside of the coalition, and we're going to support you from outside. And they want to do this for a couple of reasons. The first is, they will have influence over power just as much sitting outside the government as they would do sitting inside the government. The other benefits they get from sitting outside the government is, one, they're not going to bl get blamed for any government errors. And we know there will be government errors. The second is it's much easier for them to sit outside the government because then they can quickly flit, flit into sit sitting in opposition when the time comes. And so Nawaz Sharif, if he has his druthers, he will sit outside the government, he will support the government, and he will get, get the best of all worlds. But what he doesn't want to do, and this is where he has to play it very carefully, he doesn't want to back away from the government, from the PPP, so much that the PPP decides to ally with President Musharraf's party, the PMLQ. Clearly, President Musharraf would like to be allied with the government because that puts him in a, in a certain position of security, which he currently isn't in today. The problem for the PPP then is they lack legitimacy. The, the people clearly voted to get rid of Musharraf. And so if he allies with Musharraf, he's going to lose the legitimacy that came from the recent elections. On the other hand, for Zardari, if he allies with Musharraf's party, he has more power because Musharraf right now is in a, is in a weaker position than Nawaz Sharif is. And so the PPP is confused about which direction to go. I think what is most likely to happen is that Nawaz Sharif will come back into the government. You'll, you'll regain the coalition that you've had for a month. But they have a number of serious and very controversial decisions ahead of themselves. The reason that the government collapsed last week is because they can't decide what to do with the judiciary that Musharraf dismissed. Musharraf dismissed the judiciary, as I mentioned earlier, because the judiciary was about to judge the presidential elections as being illegal. 
and was about to depose him. Zadari does not want to reinstate the old judiciary. He doesn't want to reinstate the old judiciary because the old judiciary also happened to um, be the ones who prosecuted him for corruption previously. So he doesn't really want to see the, new, the old judiciary back. Sharif, Nawaz Sharif, on the other hand, really wants to see the old judiciary back because they supported him um, against Musharraf and they're likely to get rid of Musharraf and Musharraf, of course, deposed him back in 1999. So you've got this nice little kind of political fight going on over the judiciary, and that's one of the major decisions that they have to make, uh, and they will resolve. Um, they also have to decide what to do about President Musharraf. They have to decide whether they're going to amend the Constitution to take the power away from President Musharraf to dismiss the parliament and move that back into the prime ministership. So politically, Pakistan is a little unstable right at the moment, and it has a number of very controversial decisions ahead of itself. Economically, the picture is much more positive. Economic growth at 6% of GDP, we wouldn't mind that kind of economic growth. Um, on the other hand, they've, like many other countries around the world, they've seen recent demonstrations on electricity blackouts, they've seen recent demonstrations on the price of food, on the price of rice, on the price of wheat. So they have some problems ahead of themselves economically as well. Um, problems were compounded by the fact that the military controls vast sections of the Pakistan economy. Um, the concrete industry is owned by the military. The cereal industry is owned by the military. Uh, much of the land in Pakistan is owned by the military. Um, when you retire from the military, if you retire at a senior enough position, you either get given land or you get a senior position in the private sector. So economically, you win some, you lose some, 6% growth, but you have some fundamental problems ahead of you. Security is where it really gets nasty in Pakistan. Um, they have four major problems, not just the one, but four major problems. The first of all is this is increased Islamicization in Pakistan. And what you've seen is as the government has been ineffective, as the government has not provided social services, militant groups have stepped in to fill the void. And so many militant groups provide education, they provide social services, they provide health care, and that makes it very, very hard for the government to shut down these militant groups. You saw in the Red Mosque siege in July that strengthened these groups, that strengthened support for these groups. You've seen four attempted assassinations against President Musharraf in the past three years. So the increase, of Islam, increase in Islamization in Pakistan is a real problem. On top of that, they have what we talk about most commonly in Pakistan, which is the problem of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And this has become more complicated than it was a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, we just talked about those two groups on the, on the Pakistan-Afghan border. Today, those groups have proliferated. You now have five, four to five different, well-defined groups within that area. Um, what you're seeing is the Pakistan Taliban, one of these sets of groups, um, the objective is to take and hold land in Pakistan, and they've done a very, very good job of it. They have moved outside of the federally administered tribal areas, the Fatah, which is the area that directly is on the line between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and they're moving east, and they're taking control of areas in the northwest frontier province that were historically um, very well controlled by the government. In addition to that, you're seeing an upswing in the number of suicide attacks. In 2006, there were, by some count, five suicide attacks in Pakistan proper. In 2007, that went up to 60. So there's a huge upswing there as well. So that's problem number, security problem number two. Security problem number three is enormous levels and growing levels of sectarian violence, Shia Sunni violence within Pakistan. And then security problem number four is that the southwest province in Pakistan, Baluchistan, is undergoing a, a fight for autonomy. Baluchistan, excuse me, Baluchistan controls most of the uh, natural resources in Pakistan. And what has happened is those natural resources, the, the, the money from them, has gone to the central government and hasn't been returned to Baluchistan. And so there are a lot of Baluchis who want to see more natural resources, who want to see more returns on their natural resources. And so are fighting for increased autonomy, and that's, that's caused a lot of problems for the government. So you have four principal security problems. So, unstable politics, mixed story on economics, um, four major security problems in Pakistan, and we haven't even started to talk about the regional issues, the Indo-Pak relationship, the Pakistan-Afghan relationship, 
the relationship between Pakistan and Iran and the implications that has for the United States. So Pakistan has a number of problems ahead of itself. And so we have to ask, us, ask ourselves as we look at Pakistan, um, there are some short-term questions and there are some long-term questions. Clearly, short-term question, who is going to rule the country and what will the policies look like? The long-term question is perhaps more important, I believe, which is, is Pakistan going to follow a democratic or an authoritarian trend? What do we know? Well, let's look at the short term. What do we know in the short term? We know that the coalition government, if it comes back together, isn't going to last beyond a year. We also know that because the military is now pulled out of, out of the political system, because we now have a new general who has at least a three-year term as the chief of army staff, that our relationship with the military, regardless of what happens in the political system, will actually be fairly stable. So our ability to prosecute the war on terror to some degree will maintain some stability. We also know that there will be high and ever increasing levels of corruption. Asaf Sardari, when Benazir Bhutto, his, his wife, um, ruled Pakistan in the 90s, Asaf Sardari was called Mr. 10%. And there was reason to believe he actually took a higher percentage than that. So, he certainly, there's no reason to expect him to have changed. Nawaz Sharif, when he ruled in the 90s, he too um, let corruption proliferate. So we know there's going to be corruption in the government. We also know, again, we've seen the PPP rule in the 90s. We've seen the PMLN rule in the 90s. We know that there's, no, there's not going to be good governance. We know that any improvements in Pakistan are going to be despite the government, not because of the government. We know there will be some varying levels of legitimacy if the PPP does come back together with the PMLN. Um, that will be a more legitimate government than if Musharraf's party, the PMLQ, join. But what we also know is there are some fundamental problems in Pakistan, and those problems aren't going to change. And the subset of solutions to address those problems is pretty small. So we know that regardless of who in the short term takes over Pakistan, takes over running Pakistan, that the policies are going to look pretty much the same. And that's why I say, actually, I'm not sure it matters terribly much who in the short term runs Pakistan. And that's why it's the long term questions that are so important. And that's where all the unknowns come in. We don't know whether Pakistan's trajectory is going to be slightly upwards or slightly downwards. We do not know that when there is a re-election, who will win that re-election. And I will just put a little note here, and we can talk about this later. We don't know whether the PPP, the party that Zadari currently runs, will split. And if it does, that could, could, lots of caveats here, that could be a very good thing for Pakistan. And perhaps the most important question that we don't know the answer to is will the people stay involved in the political process? The people who came out in March of last year and who haven't been seen since the 70s, will they stay involved? Given all of this, where does the US come in? Well, our goal is pretty clear. We want a stable, democratic Pakistan that doesn't support terrorism. What's our policy been? This is the same goal we've held for years. What's our policy been? Well, historically, and our policy has been prior prioritized as the following. Priorities one, two, three, four, five has been the war on terror. Priority six and seven, the war on terror. Priority eight, non-proliferation. Priority nine and 10, the war on terror. Priority 11, stability. 12, 13, 14, the war on terror. And perhaps 15, we've got to democracy. Clearly, that strategy hasn't worked. <laughs> so what do we need to do looking forward? What do we need to do moving forward? Um, first of all, we need to do something that is extraordinarily hard in the political system, in the, in the system that we have where people have four-year terms, perhaps eight-year terms. We need to look long-term, not short-term. A short-term solution to Pakistan, there is not one. So we need to start thinking long-term, not short-term. We need to prioritize democracy first and foremost. 40 plus percent of the population came out to vote in February of this year. 40 percent came out to vote despite 
there being a pretty good chance that there were going to be bombs going off in, in polling stations. And despite the fact that they knew it was not a legitimate, gov uh, legitimate election, just think about that. 40 plus percent, over 50 million people, came out to vote despite the insecurity and despite the fact that they weren't sure that their votes were going to count. So I ask you, why are we not talking to this 50 million people? Why are we not engaging with this 50 million people? And they came out, urban and rural. Actually, oddly enough, the rural population tends to vote higher than the urban does. Rich and poor. And again, interestingly, um, much higher numbers came out in the poor areas than the, than the wealthy areas. Young and old. I was in Pakistan for the election, and I was stunned. I'm standing at the polls. And you've got families coming to vote. You've got women bringing their mothers and their five-year-old children coming to vote. It was a party in some areas. So we need to focus on democracy. We need to focus on this 40-plus percent. We need to work on education. We need to work on health care. We need to work on social services. We need to work on grassroots organizing. Priority one. Priority two, clearly stability the Indo-Pakistan relationship, the Pak-Afghan relationship, these are very, very important, and that should be our second <coughs> priority. Priority number three, clearly terrorism. And I do not call it the global war on terror. 58%, there were polls taken uh, in the period December, January, and the polls showed 58% of those polled did not su support the global war on terror, and they did not support Pakistani involvement in the global war on terror. On the other hand, the polls also show that the second most important issue to Pakistanis for the elections was their own stability and their own security. Pakistanis are worried about the increasing militancy within Pakistan. And so what does this tell you? What this tells me is that trying to get Pakistan for the support for the global war on terror does not work. But actually trying to get Pakistan support to do something about their own stability and security, that does work. That they can get behind. And given that those two things overlap rather a lot, then maybe we should redefine what our goal is. And we should actually help them achieve stability and security in Pakistan. And so, so, so priority number three is terrorism, but is not necessarily the global war on terror. And that means doing things like we're beginning to do now. Build capacity. Train Pakistanis. Train the trainers so they can train their military. This means working on hearts and minds. It's an awful phrase, but it does actually matter. Um, working on bringing in the, that population of the federally administered tribal areas that have never truly been considered part of Pakistan. They haven't been given the rights that other Pakistanis have been given. How can we expect them to actually follow the dictates of the Pakistani government if we don't give them the same kind of, if they don't give them the same kind of rights and opportunities? So that's priority number three is terrorism. And then clearly priority number four is non-proliferation. And I put this, you might say, but, but what about weapons of mass destruction? And I put this as priority four because it is just as important, if not more so, for Pakistanis and just as much in their best interest to ensure that there is no further proliferation as it is in ours. And let me finish with this. What we don't need to be worried about. We do not need to be worried about loose nukes in Pakistan. And we do not need to be worried today about extremists taking over Pakistan. What we do need to be worried about is that if five or ten years from now we don't encourage the people to participate, if we don't in support them coming out to vote this year, if we don't give them some reason to believe that by participating in a democratic process they can see change in their country, then that percentage of people is going to find other ways to have their voices heard. And while we don't need to worry about it today, five or ten years from now, we do need to worry about it. Because those alternatives are not going to be quite so democratic and they are not going to be quite so peaceful. And so. We need to ensure today, and this is back to my cautious optimism, today the West, and particularly the United States, has an incredible opportunity to help the Pakistani government 
ensure that the voices of the people who voted on February 18th are heard and are encouraged. And if we do that, I predict Pakistan will go on a positive trajectory. And then Pakistan will become the opportunity that it could be rather than the threat that we see it of today. With that, I'll end and take questions. So the, the question was, what is, what is a democracy in Pakistan going to look like? Um, frankly, I don't know, but I'll tell you something. Since independence in 1947, Pakistan has seen democracy. This is not a country that doesn't, we're not talking about Iraq. Um, we're talking about a country that has veered in and out of democracy for 60 years. I mean, it's almost inevitable, excepting the 90s in Pakistan, you could pretty much predict that after a democratic government, you're going to have an authoritarian military government, and then you're going to get a democratic government, and then you're going to get an authoritarian military government. So it hasn't been a stable democracy in any way, shape, or form. But it has been a democracy throughout the 90s, actually. This is the exception to the rule. Um, one of the reasons that this coalition between the PPP and the PMLN doesn't last is because it would be like asking the Democratic and the Republican Party to come together and govern as one government. <laughs> Throughout the 90s, the baton, if you will, passed between Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto, neither being able to last a full term. I mean, four different governments from, I think, 19, 19, 1988 to 1999, or 1989 to 1999. Four different governments. Um, what we do know, and this is... This is uh, <coughs> just like to, to kind of emphasize again. People came out in March of last year for an independent judiciary. That's something we understand. 40 plus percent came out to vote. Voting that looks not dissimilar from ours. They opened the schools. The Most of the um, voting is um, one gender. So it's women's vote separately from men, but sometimes it would be the same school in different classrooms. Um, they don't, they show IDs, they have their hand inked so they can't go and vote again and then they, you know, go into a little corner and they scribble on their ballot and they, they put it in. It looks like ours, perhaps a little bit messier, perhaps a little bit dustier, um, perhaps a little bit more of a party than it is when I voted in this country, but nevertheless, it looks a bit like ours. So what does a democracy look like? They've had it before. It looks not dissimilar from our democracy. Um... So I say it's, it's not something that they're trying to create from nothing. Um, so it's not as, it's not as um, scary a thought as trying to understand how do, you, how do you instate democracy in Afghanistan or how do you instate democracy in, in Iraq. What's the size of the military and what role are they playing now? Um, the military isn't, I mean, it's, it's not overly large. It's, it's a significant uh, body. The military used to be larger. Um, but it is it is gone down. What is what is problematic in actually understanding the size of the military is it's kind of unclear when people leave the military. Um, so they they retire, but there are an awful lot of military leaders who who now are leading corporations that theoretically are independent private entities. But it's not entirely sure whether they're part of the military and how you know there are multiple military foundations kind of veterans affairs, except there isn't one, there's something like eight of them. Um, so it's a little hard, I mean, I can't give you a number because it, it, it's a little hard. And that also answers the question of what position do they have now. Um, the military have historically been the, the kind of strongest entity, the, the most effective entity in Pakistan. They've, they've historically been very, very well respected in Pakistan. Um, over the last seven years, that respect has diminished significantly. And one of the things that the new general, General Kiani, has been trying to do over the last five or six months is to pull the military out of the policy debate. He's pulled all of the military personnel out of civilian government. He's trying to re-legitimize the military. Um, I don't know whether many of you um, followed the news about, uh, I think it was about six months ago now, when in the Fatah, 250 uh, military soldiers just dropped their weapons, surrendered to the Taliban. Yeah. Um, actions like that have not done the reputation of the military any good. <laughs> and so what General Kiani is trying to do is change that. Now what we don't know is, what we do know is that the military, um, like most such organizations, is unlikely to want to pull out of government so far that it 
is losing a certain amount of control. But we do know that it needs to pull out to regain the legit legitimacy that it's lost. Um, we also know that the military, as I said earlier, controls much of the economy. Um, and so it's what is going to be most important, General Kiani is definitely heading the military in a positive direction. Um, what is perhaps going to be most important is who takes over from him in a couple of years and whether he also has the same intent to move the military back. Um, the question was, um, some years ago, um, the lady heard somebody from the UN say that Pakistan was not a viable state. Um, is that true? Um, I'd like to know who at the UN said it, and I'm guessing it was probably um, somebody from the delegation from India. <laughs> um, there have been, the, following the elections or during the election process, there's been, there's been a lot of comments that Pakistan is going to break up. Pakistan is made up of four states. Um, and that Pakistan is going to break up. Um, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, there's no reason to think that Pakistan would break up. Pakistan is not, um, is not a creation in the same way that Iraq is a creation. Clearly, there are some efforts um, within Baluchistan, I mentioned earlier, kind of a drive for more autonomy. But there's nobody really, or there are few people who really want to say we want to be independent of Pakistan. Um, equally, in the Kashmir region, in Azad Kashmir, the Pakistani side of Kashmir, there are many who would say, we want to be independent. But actually, that, that voice is not being heard terribly much. So, so I, don't, uh, I don't put much credibility in, in the story that Pakistan is actually going to break, break up into separate states. No. The question was, what motivates the common person to get out to vote? Um, what motivates anybody to get out to vote? I'm talking about that election. Well, I mean, I, I, but I, I would say, I mean, what motivates anybody? What, what motivates us? Why are we all going to get out to vote on, on November 4th? We're going to get out to vote because we actually believe that there needs to be changes in government, and we believe that one person could do better than the next person. Um, so I would argue that most of the Pakistanis who went out to vote went out to vote because they believed that there could be a better, better form of governance. Now, perhaps a little idealistic, um, there are clearly some people who went out to vote because they got paid to go out to vote. Um, but I would say the vast majority went out to vote because they believed that there was somebody who could run the government better than the alternative. I think that, that, that what was clear from the election, I'm sorry, the question is, was there a belief by the common people that there were better candidates out there than previously? I actually think that, it was the, the, the vote was more a vote against something than for something in many cases. So what was clearly co coming out from the election was that people were against the continuation of the, of the Mushraf era. And then that was the clearest message that came out. Um, the PPP, Benazir, the, the Bhutto party, I have to stop saying Benazir Bhutto's party, it's, it's, it's been with me too long, but the Bhutto party. And what we do know in Pakistan, uh, and I said this to somebody earlier, Pakistan politics is personality driven. It isn't policy driven. This actually isn't true just of Pakistan. I mean, this is true of South Asia. I mean, you know, India. Yeah, it's true of the United States, yes. Um, perhaps more so now than normally, but nevertheless. Um, but in Pakistan, people don't, people vote for, for individuals. They vote, vote for parties. So the four states, um, the Punjab, the Punjab is historic, it's the most wealthy state in Pakistan, and it is the Bhutto party's state. Excuse me, it is, the, is Nawaz Sharif's state. It is the PMLN state. The only quasi-national party in Pakistan is the Bhutto party, is the PPP. And they take Sindh, one of the other provinces. Um, that's where most of their support is, but they have some support in the other states. Nawaz Sharif, he takes Punjab. We know that. And people support who their father supported. So with people support Bhutto. But what we do know is what they don't support is President Mushroff. And that was, that was what was clearly the statement, whether it was he lost the support of the middle class uh, and, and the, the judiciary clearly in, in March. He lost the support of the more extreme elements, the more religious elements, I should say, of Pakistan in July with the Red Mosque siege. He lost the support of the kind of more legitimate centrist political parties when he declared a state of emergency. I mean, President Mushraf, over the period of a year, managed to lose all of the main bodies of power within Pakistan. 
How does having the U.S. military in Afghanistan affect the thinking of the people in Afghanistan? Um, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, we're, we're, we're stuck in a somewhat of a quandary, um, not dissimilar from the quandary that we are stuck in, in in Iraq, which is to say, on the one hand, um, without the U.S. military or without international military, uh, insecurity will take over. On the other hand, the U.S. military is seen as an invading force. Um, the the one of the solutions to this in Afghanistan that has been reasonably successful in Afghanistan, less less we've been able to implement it less in Iraq, has been the creation of what they call provincial reconstruction teams, PRTs, which we've built, I think there's something in the 20s today in Afghanistan. And what that is, is it has to some extent a military core to provide security that surrounds a group of individuals who work on economics, who work on agriculture, who work on healthcare, who work on education. <coughs> and it's essentially, um, let's let these people create the social services and the military provides the security to allow us to do that. Um, and so it is going to be a um, real problem balancing the need to keep military forces on the ground to provide the security to allow the government to take over social services, to, to allow um, social services to be built. Uh, the, the solution that the US government has come up with, and really the only solution, is you have to train the Afghan military as fast as you possibly can, and the Afghan police force to take over, and lower the numbers as quickly as you can. And, and that's what we're doing. I think we're up to something like 70,000 uh, in the Afghan army. Uh, unfortunately, they're not as, effect as effective as we would like them to be, but again, that takes time. It's, it's, a real, it's, a, it's a real problem. Okay. Um, how is Musharraf, given that he's lost all the support, um, still regarded as president? Uh, one clear, clear way. Um, president Musharraf, uh, two actually. First of all, President Musharraf uh, has the authority to dismiss the parliament. He currently holds the authority to dismiss the parliament. So, hypothetically speaking, if he doesn't like what's happening in the parliament, he just gets rid of it, rid of it, and calls another set of elections. Now, he's unlikely to do that because he would probably lose more than he did in the last election. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, where does his power come from? That's where his power comes from. The other reason that Musharraf um, has has some power today is because the PPP and the PMLN can't work together. And so, if you can imagine Musharraf's strategy, I probably shouldn't say this. There are no Pakistani supporters of Musharraf here in the room, please. <laughs> Um, if, Mushra, if, if I'm in his position, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put a wedge between the two, the PM, PPP and the PMLA. That's not terribly hard to do, as we've seen. I mean, the, the coalition has already collapsed within a month. Because if he can keep the two of them not working together, then there's, a, there's an opportunity for his party, the King's party, the PMLQ, <coughs> to get into government. And so nobody, they don't, so he kind of retains that, that, kingmaker, in a sense, that alternative power. And until the coalition comes together, does something about the judiciary, and the constitution is changed to take the, the right <coughs> of dismissing the, the, the parliament away from President Musharraf, he will retain a fair amount of power in Pakistan. So the simple answer is, constitutionally, he is named president. Constitutionally, he has power. What is the percentage of and geographic of the Sunni, Shia, and Wahhabi? Um, it's about 90% uh, Sunni, 10% Shia. So it's, it's, it's definitely, um, and it, that's kind of interesting. I mean, it's, it's definitely majority Sunni, um, which actually raises kind of the interesting question of how is it that Pakistan and Iran have such good relations? Because, of course, Iran is majority Shia. Um, and we can, they talk about civilizational links, um, long-term links. Um, I, I have a bit more of a realpolitik attitude towards it, which is Pakistan already has what they perceive to be an enemy on their, their eastern border. They really don't want it, and, and an enemy on their northwestern border, Afghanistan, which they don't trust. They really don't want to see an enemy on their southwestern border, um, and, and vice versa. And Iran needs the legitimacy of keeping friends, um, and there's an energy link between the two of them. But it's, it's majority Sunni. Uh, and and the sectarian violence within Pakistan has increased 
over, over recent years. And you don't hear so much about that because you're hearing about all the other violence that's taking place in Pakistan. How was that? Um, the US government, quite understandably, we are much better at dealing with other governments. And it makes sense. I mean, you know, you, you tend to deal on kind of equal levels. Um, historically, um, when USAID was a bit more of a powerful organization and when USAID, US Agency for International Development, didn't actually report to the Secretary of State, which it, that was a change that was made in the last, in this administration, um, USAID did an absolutely superb job of actually working with grassroots organizations, um, working with, Pakistan has a pretty well-developed NGO, non-profit uh, 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 sector. And so USAID has done a very good job in the past of working with these sectors. And so when I say that we need to actually start working um, not just on a government to government level, but we actually need to start working on a, on, on a kind of a lower level, people to people level, NGOs to NGOs. Um, we need to start, we, since 2001, since September 11th, um, we have in one form or another given approximately 10 to 11 billion US dollars to Pakistan. Of that 10 to 11 billion, 9 billion was military aid. And so I ask you, really, does that make sense? Um, I don't think so. Now, we clearly need to work with the military. Uh, I'm not suggesting we pull away from military to military links. The military, as I've mentioned, has a very, very important role in Pakistan. But, for example, Senator Biden has, has put a new bill on, on, um, up for debate that says... Um, we should be giving Pakistan a much higher proportion of social and economic assistance than we currently do. Um, we need to turn the tables on that ratio. We should continue to provide military assistance. But instead of providing military assistance based on operations they say they conduct, let's provide military assistance based on results that come in. It's an interesting idea. Hard to, hard to verify, but it's a really interesting idea. Um, we should be giving Pakistan a democracy dividend. Let's give them some incentive to continue down this path. And he suggested a billion a year. Sounds like a lot, but if you look at the numbers that we're providing in Afghanistan, you look at the numbers we're providing in Iraq, a billion a year actually isn't an awful lot of money. And certainly not if you then think about how important Pakistan is to us today. <laughs> So I, that, that would be my answer. We need to work much more on a people-to-people -people level as well as military-to-military, government-to-government. And we've done that in the past. And we've actually been pretty good at it in the past. So the question was, what is the influence of the ISI, the, secret, the, the intelligence services in Pakistan, in the political arena today, particularly in light of the fact that um, during the 80s, we, we, the United States, provided an awful lot of military assistance and an awful lot of funds to the ISI that subsequently provided them to the Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. Um, uh, the question of whether the ISI has much of the military hardware today, actually it doesn't. I mean, we've been working increasingly, I mean, I mean maybe, maybe I'll take a step further back. One of the problems that we have with Pakistan <coughs> is that Pakistanis don't trust us. And frankly, they have good reason not to trust us. Um, the United States has engaged very closely with Pakistan, built great relationship with Pakistan when we need something from Pakistan. And when we no longer need something from Pakistan, we've turned our back and we've walked away. And we've done this repeatedly. And so actually, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a m missed by most, a statement that President Bush made in March of 2006 when he was in Pakistan. And he said, I think for the first time publicly, we want a long-term strategic relationship with Pakistan. Well, it's actually quite easy to say, and it's quite hard to prove to the Pakistanis we really mean it. And why does this matter? This matters because when we were supporting uh, Pakistan, and particularly the ISI, support the Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, we had very, very good relations with Pakistan. And then in the 90s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we just walked away and we left Pakistan to its own troubles. And of course, a decade later, we're back wanting to talk to the Pakistanis. But what the, what's different this time around is we're not actually working with the ISI. We've been working for the last five or six years with the military. 
military to military links much more than intelligence service to intelligence service to links, although those do take place today. And so actually most of the military hardware is with the army, not with the ISI. That being said, the military does have a significant role and the ISI has always long believed to have had a significant role in political elections in the political process. And again, here's one of the interesting things about the uh, elections earlier this year. Under the leadership of Kiani, he made, he took over, if you remember, in late November, elections were in February. He made very, very clear that the ISI and the army were not getting involved in the elections this time around. And a lot of people believe that that statement, that insistence, that mandate, if you will, from Kiani, is what ensured that on the day, the elections were actually pretty fair. Not the one-off, but on the day, they were pretty fair. And so what appears to be, again, this is back to General Kiani, um, a, a general who had some education in the United States and has a very good relationship and a good understanding of the United States, what is clear is he's trying to pull the military out of politics. And so how far he takes it, how far he wants to take it, how far he can take it, because very few organizations want to actually give up power, is a little uncertain today. But so what we do know is it's heading in the right direction. Wow. Um, <laughs> can I pass? Um, the question is, are there any guiding principles for the US government to deal with um, uh, independence movements, whether they're in the Balkans, whether they're in, whether it's the Spanish government in Spain, whether it's in Pakistan. Um, not my specialty, so I'm going to preface this with a with a with a little caveat. But I would say uh, you you gave us the answer yourself, which is often these movements stem from the haves and the have-nots. If you look at Pakistan. <coughs> Um, the movement, independence movement in Baluchistan is absolutely about we have these natural resources and you're taking them away and you're not giving us anything back. If you look at the problems in the Fatah, in the federally administered tribal areas, it's you ask us to do what you want, to, want us to do, you ask us to live by your walls, but yet you're not going to give us political parties, you don't provide us social services, you haven't built any infrastructure. If you look at what's going on in Kashmir, in Azad Kashmir is a slightly different story. I mean, that's, that's much more of a historical um, blowback from, from the independence and the split of India and Pakistan. Um, but in, in many of these movements, it is about we are feeling like we're giving and we're not getting anything back. And so you gave the solution yourself, which is actually if you treat these people fairly, if you do give back some recompense, and I will caveat this with define fair. That's extraordinarily hard to do. But if you can find some way of actually giving people what everybody else is perhaps happen having, then many, many people actually just want to exist. They want to be able to live. They want to be able to make a living. And that certainly is the case in Kashmir. Many of the Kashmiris today say, can we just get over this? We actually want to be able to make a living. We want to be able to visit our family. We want to be able to move easily. <coughs> they're less interested today about whether they're part of India or whether they're part of Pakistan or whether they're an independent entity. <laughs> uh, the question was, what would happen if the US started dropping food and um, water into the Delta area in, in Burma, um, Myanmar? Um, people tend to be terribly <coughs> sensitive about sovereignty. And so we, we have a, what is a, in fact, a huge moral dilemma today, which is, on the one hand, if we do nothing, thousands of people will die. And on the other hand, if we do something, then we are invading another country's sovereignty. Um, and so we have a moral dilemma. What I think we are doing, and I think is uh, on a very personal level, I believe is probably the, the, to the extent that there's an interim, is we're working with a number, we are providing assistance into um, the capital, into Rangoon, Yangon, um, that, the, that then the Burmese military is, is um, distributing. We are, I believe, working with a number of other countries maybe not distributing as fairly as they should or effectively as they should. Um, 
but there is, um, we are working with a number of other countries, the, the Southeast Asian countries that historically have better relations with the Burmese than we do. Um, we're working with those, and they are actually getting into the regions um, more effectively than we're able to do so. But dropping water and food isn't going to do it. If, if you're going to do it right, then you need to have helicopters going in. You need to be able to provide um, assistance to people on the ground. Um, and if you have helicopters going in, then you also need to have fighter planes going in so that they can protect the helicopters. Um, and then you've essentially declared war on another country, and I'm not entirely sure that the United States wants to declare war on another country right now. <laughs> uh, uh, um, we are the world's policemen. We do not want to be the world's policemen. Um, and it's, it's one of the fundamental problems with having the capabilities. We spend in in defense, we spend more, I think, than the next, something like the next 10 countries all added together. Yeah. And what this means is that we fundamentally have more capabilities to actually provide than the next 10 countries added together. Um, and so we don't want to be the world's policemen, but we happen to be the most effective people. And until we can get other countries to start spending and providing the capabilities, heavy lift, lift capabilities, things of this nature, we are going to continue to provide. We also continue to provide because the people within America actually believe that we should be. And so it's kind of our responsibility as well. I'll give you a, a, the other side, however. It's, it's not quite as bad as it looks um, sometimes and sometimes feels. Um, the, the tsunami response, I don't know whether you all remember the tsunami in um, yeah. December 26, I think it was, 2005. Within 24 hours, there was a core group up and running, made up of, I think it was the United States, India, Canada, Australia, and I forget the fifth country. Japan. Japan, yes. Um, Within 24 hours, we were working together to provide assistance, whether it was food and water, it was military assistance, it was, it was um, things, any, anything that was needed. Um, that core group was stood down five days later because the UN was able to respond. It just took them a little longer to get there. There was a great chart that um, the US government did at the time, that they took a kind of chart of the geography of that region, and for every major um, airplane, ship, assistance um, from a country, it had a little flag. And as you can well predict, American flags were all over the map. But Indian flags were all over the map too, and Australian flags were all over the map, and Japanese flags were all over the map, and Indonesian flags, and Thai flags, and European flags. Chinese flags were hardly to be seen at all, but People were responding from across the world. People were responding. People who were affected were responding to help their neighbors. So while, yes, it sometimes feels like we are the world's policemen and we're the only ones out there doing something, actually, to the extent that others have the capabilities, they're out there doing things too. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't in any way underestimate that or undervalue that. Thank you. The baton was passed between uh, Deputy Secretary Armitage and Jack Straw from the UK and the French Foreign Minister and the Canadian Foreign Minister and pretty much for about three weeks we made sure that there was at least one senior foreign leader from a Western country in either Islamabad and New Delhi because we reckoned that Pakistan might declare nuclear war on India but they weren't about to declare nuclear war on the United States or Canada or France and as long as we had a senior leader, that wasn't going to happen. Today, they've had five rounds of composite dialogue, five rounds of negotiation, and I was talking to a number of senior Indians of March of last year, and they were saying, we have a solution to Kashmir. So they've agreed, apparently, privately, on a solution to Kashmir. Now, of course, President Musharraf um, fell to new depths starting in March of last year, and so that deal was never put on the table, it was never publicized, and now, to some extent, we have to start again because you've got a new Pakistani government and you, you don't know where they're going to come out. 
but what we do know between cricket diplomacy that, sh again, should not be underestimated. Back to, back to kind of engaging people to people rather than to elites to elites, what was most amazing with this cricket diplomacy with the two sides playing cricket is you had Indians, your middle class Indians going to Pakistan and vice versa and realizing these, these are my brothers, they look like me, they talk like me, they have the same concerns that I do, and that made a huge difference in attitudes and what was possible in terms of compromises. And so, while clearly there could be a downturn in relations, and clearly there are many who want to see a downturn in relations, and every time there's a major attack, as there was a couple of weeks ago in India, everybody holds their breath waiting to see what the response is. Thus far, it's been a fairly stable relationship for the last four or five years, and, it, and it's looking good. So I'm, I'm actually optimistic about it. Thank you.